Welcome everyone to day three of the Weekend Climate Justice Forum, Facing the Climate Emergency on the Road to COP27, Solutions and Perspectives from Global Women and Gender Diverse Leaders, which we're hosting during Climate Week and the UN General Assembly here in New York. My name is Osprey Royal Lake, and I'm, I'm the Executive Director of the Women's Earth and Climate Action Network, WECAN, and I'm really honored to be here on the Napa Territory here in Manhattan. I'm getting a little echo. I think we, someone needs to go on mute. Thank you. Um, I wanted to welcome all of you to our panel, Women Leading Fossil Fuel Divestment and Resistance. And for those of you who are just joining us now, please be welcome to put your name and where you're from in the chat. We're really excited to have this conversation with you and, and uh, hear from all these really amazing women about the work they're doing. Frontline women and global advocates are building critical strategies for national and international divestment from harmful extractive industries and militarism, while we're also calling for justice and accountability from financial institutions. It's really past time for investments to move toward a just transition that puts people and planet first and not continued destruction. Many groups are organizing for strategic campaigns to call for divestment, to stop fossil fuel pipelines, stop fossil fuel infrastructure and extraction at the source, and to supp stop supply chains that lead to deforestation. At WECAN, we've been really honored to work um, on many different divestment campaigns, uh, some with the speakers uh, on this panel, which we've been very honored to do, and also with Michelle Cook, who's the founder of Divest, Invest, Protect. And given the escalating climate crisis, I mean, what we're seeing all over the world now from Pakistan to what is happening in Puerto Rico. Um, I live in California. We've had incredible forest fires, as many of you know. Um, most of us in, in the Bay Area where I live, our, our lungs are damaged from this. And we know that the escalating climate crisis is going to cause more harms to our communities. And we need to urgently stop the flow of money to the fossil fuel industry and companies engaged in deforestation commodities. We cannot lose any more forests. And uh, our panelists will be also speaking about this. And instead, we need financial institutions to invest in renewable, regenerative energy and community-led solutions while also respecting indigenous rights. We know that it's really key that if we wanna protect high biodiverse areas like the Amazon rainforest, which the entire world depends on for um, our air, our water. Um, we, we need to really look to the indigenous peoples who are the best custodians of their own lands. 80% of all the biodiversity left on earth is in the hands and lands of indigenous peoples. So protecting their rights is key to the solution that we're facing, that we need to face in terms of the climate crisis. And, um, you know, it's it's something that a lot of financial institutions talk about having human and indigenous rights policies, but then they don't adhere to them or they don't have any indigenous rights policies at all. So we're going to get into that a little bit as we go forward. Today, I'm really excited because We Can is releasing the second edition of our report, Gendered and Racial Impacts of the Fossil Fuel Industry and Complicit Financial Institutions. We name names and go after the financiers of dangerous and dirty projects. And we're really honored that several of the women featured in the case studies in the report are on the panel today, as well as one of the medical professionals who reviewed the report. The report is being delivered to financial institutions around the world because the harms and health impacts from the fossil fuel industry really need to stop. Harms from air and water pollution impact pregnant women, there is sexual violence against indigenous women due to man camps, which are temporary housing units for men at sites of fossil fuel development. There are harms to communities all over the world. And on top of this, there's the accelerating climate crisis that financial institutions continue to invest in. And what we're doing is we're saying, no more sacrifice people, no more sacrifice zones, divest now. And with that, I want to welcome this powerful panel of leaders. And thank you all for the tremendous work that you are doing. Um, and uh, really wanted to thank you for taking the time to be with us. 
And uh, right now in the chat, we're putting uh, the link to the divestment report that we released today. And I also just want to acknowledge that um, Layla, who's on the panel, we were a little bit fired up because we actually just came from an action right here in New York City during Climate Week, uh, where we got to um, deliver uh, the report right to the front door today. So um, with that, let me introduce these amazing women, and then we will hand the floor over to them. First, we're going to be hearing from Dawn Goodwin. She is Ojibwe, White Earth. She's a representative of the Indigenous Environmental Network and co-founder of RISE Coalition. Uh, then we'll be hearing from Rojeda Ozain. She's a community organizer for Southwest Louisiana and Southeast Texas um, from the Healthy Gulf. And then we'll hear from Lolita Sura Paneni. She's an MD, Assistant Professor, General Internal Medicine at the University of Minnesota. And then we will hear from Jody Evans, who's the co-founder of Code Pink. And then last but not least, we will hear from Leila Salza Lopez, who's the executive director of Amazon Watch. So truly an incredible group of women leaders. Um, I'm really honored to have you here. And I'd like to hand the floor over to Dawn uh, to, to tell us about what's happening in your community due, due to fossil fuel extraction and, and what you'd like to share with us. Thank you. Um, my name is Everlasting Wind, and I live in White Earth. I'm coming at you live here from uh, Nagachawanan, uh, Fond du Lac Reservation. I'm here uh, with my Raya sisters, um, Red Bark, on our next journey. Uh, I'll be going to Minneapolis, and we'll be opening up a um, leadership center for uh, social justice at the United uh, Villa Mary, and we'll be doing teaching the class there. So that's what's happening um, as a day. Um, yes, yeah, so I live over by White Earth and we um, are just in July 93 slash 93 because it was renamed once it was um, relocated into my homelands. And, um, and it's actually, you know, I live um, like 20, I would say about 20 miles from um, the the new line there in Clearwater County, Minnesota. Um, but I have a family home within a mile of the new line, and actually some other existing lines. Uh, so just a little bit. Uh, last year was just a whirlwind. Um, front lines. Um, I did not um, actually tie myself down to any machinery. However, I would have loved to. Um, we had a different uh, atmosphere in my county um, with some work that was done prior to um, an educational center. We invited um, the mayor, uh, family, and uh, police, and all the uh, county commissioners. And uh, let's see, just uh, seeing something there on the screen. Um, I'll just keep talking. I think somebody maybe can't see or hear me. Um, oh, I think I maybe, Don, maybe you could turn your video off and we could hear you better. It's a little bit choppy. Let's turn your video off and just hear the sound. Okay, let's try that. But we can hear you. It's just a little choppy. Okay. All right. How is that? A little better? Yes. Okay. So let's, um, I'll just back up a little bit. Don Goodwin, I'm from White Earth. Um, last year we had uh, Line 3 Front Lines. Um, we named it 93 after it was put in. Um, it did create a lot of division within our community before, during, and after. Um, a lot of people were afraid to come in and get involved just because of um, police presence and whatnot. Although we did have um, a different scenario in Clearwater County, and that was um, promised by our sheriff uh, prior to uh, during an educational summit that we uh, put on in 2019. And um, at that summit, the sheriff was invited, the mayor, the commissioners of each um, the county or uh, the township 
what are those called? Well, anyway, the, the people of the townships, they were all invited. Um, none of them came. Um, the biased newspaper reporters showed up. So that's a whole another story. But um, at that time, <clears throat> the sheriff, who I actually um, was a year younger than me, and a family friend, um, the mother and his wife, I worked with them at the school. And he promised me that he um, would protect our First Amendment. That was his oath that he took the, to protect our right to assemble peacefully. And, um, and he did, he protected that. And so last year we had the Treaty Peoples Gathering. And if you're not uh, familiar with that, um, we all understand about, uh, well, I hope you do. Um, and if you don't, I hope I'm educating you some. Uh, the treaty, treaty people, we are all treaty people with that notion that the United States was created under the guise of treaties, negotiations with the native peoples. So our treaty in particular um, that I live in um, is the 1855 treaty. And that treaty is a war and peace treaty. And so our uh, ancestors signed that agreement to let the settlers come in and move and live in the, on the lands. And that we agreed to live in peace together. Um, so with that, we retained our inherent rights, but we gave rights to the settlers to come and live. So that is where that we came up with the treaty people, that we are all treaty people. And so our non-native allies were supporting us in our treaty. Um, <laughs> and that's the right to hunt and gather and also to protect the lands, travel and occupy. So that led with a day in uh, treaty encampment on one of the easements where um, we stayed until we controlled that native. And we stayed on the bridge for eight days and um, talked with the sheriff every day until we got an eviction notice from Enbridge that was full of lies. We counteracted that um, with our own press conference and the sheriff knew it was lies and we did not accept it. But we did agree that when we were done with ceremony that we would leave. And we wanted to leave this place in the best possible way even before we came. And so when the sheriff reported after we left, he said he found not even a gum wrapper. Uh, so that is a, a good way in the relationship that worked. Um, so if that helps people that are moving forward, um, that's one thing that was in Clearwater County, but it was a little different narrative. Um, Oops. Dawn, we've lost you. Um, Ashley, can you go ahead and text her and let her know we'll bring her back in again later? I'm back. Oh, here just, I am. Okay. But I'm probably up on my minutes. Um, but now we have seen some different things happening in our own climate and we understand um, you know, what that pipeline was about. It wasn't just about a pipeline. It was about tar sands, oil, and our climate. So how it was equal to 30 new power plants. Um, that oil that they moving, it would be like putting 30 new power plants in. And so we know how that affects our climate. And so we have just noticed different changes in our climate as far as extreme um, uh, heat and also drought, especially last year um, when we had, um, it was actually beyond extreme. It was, um, what did I call that? Extraordinary drought. <laughs> it was beyond extreme. And then um, Enbridge was allowed to actually up their water um, dewatering permits from 5 million gallons to 5 billion gallons. And that was, we figured it's because of the aquifer breaches, um, three aquifer breaches um, that were reported by Ambridge. However, we were able to do a thermal flyover and it indicates possibly up to 40 
different aquifer breaches um, throughout line threes slash 93's new line. And so they coined that um, a replacement project. But what they weren't saying that was that it was also um, not only a replacement, but a relocation and a different kind of oil. So it wasn't conventional crude anymore, but they always fail to mention that it was tar sands oil and that it sinks in water going under 22 rivers and through across. And we've seen um, many, many frack oats and witnessed it um, at the Mississippi River. And we were told to guard the big river with our lives. And so that is why I was there. Um, so yes, uh, climate change. And it's affected our rice crop too this year in, in different areas all through Minnesota. Uh, the Boys Fort Reservation closed their large lake, um, Net Lake. And then also Fond du Lac actually closed all their lakes within their reservation boundaries. And there are some strange um, algae blooms on some of the rice lakes um, just outside of the reservation. Uh, so just some effects from climate change. And Miigwech, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, John, for joining us. And uh, we have a beautiful photo of you showing uh, on the screen since we couldn't uh, see your wonderful face with the video. Um, but we do see you on the screen, just so you know. And, um, you know, I just wanted to thank you for your incredible resistance work, your leadership, um, not only during line three, which I know is an ongoing fight and struggle, but also all the work you're doing to support all of the front lines on line five with the same company, Enbridge, and all the same financiers. Um, and um, it's really uh, been wonderful to work with Thon and learn from her and her community. Um, also about the, not just the, um, the health impacts and impacts to the rice, which she was talking about and the climate impacts, but also during uh, the construction of line three, there were reports that um, we have put into the report I mentioned earlier that we released today around trafficking um, of indigenous women and girls and violations and some of those uh, violators were workers along the Line 3 pipeline. So this is also why we've been talking about um, the issue uh, epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women in relationship to the fossil fuel industry. And uh, Line 3 is uh, one of the deep case studies in the report you can learn about. Um, so this is like really important, another reason why we need to get the financiers out. And with that, I would like to hand the floor over to Rosheta Ozain. You have the floor. Picket lines and picket signs. Don't punish me with brutality. Come talk to me so you can see what's going on. Good afternoon. Those were words made famous by the artist, singer, songwriter Marvin Gaye. Um, many of you probably have heard. I am Rochetta Ozan. I am from Southwest Louisiana. I'm currently in Westlake, Louisiana, home to several petrochemical industries, Philip 66, Sassol, Westlake Chemical. All of those industries are right in front of me. I'm sitting in the, in the parking lot of the high school. It's homecoming week. So as many of you may know, I have six children. I'm a single mom of six. And that they are part of the reason why I am fighting the way that I'm fighting um, to stop fossil fuel divestment. We here in Southwest Louisiana were hit by two major hurricanes in the last two years, Hurricane Laura and Hurricane Delta. Many of us lost our homes. We lost um, our residence, a place where we had been living for years and our children had grown up. We lost all of that and had to relocate. I had to move out of Westlake and move to Sulphur. Lived in a hotel for several months and then in a FEMA trailer for almost two years. And I just recently moved out of that FEMA trailer into a permanent home that I was able to purchase for myself and my children. Not only were we hit by two hurricanes, but we also had um, winter storm Uri, which was a record breaking freeze for our area. And shortly after that, we were hit with what the mayor of Lake Charles has called a 100 year flood. We had never seen flooding like that in Southwest Louisiana before. 
And if you didn't lose your home during the hurricanes or during the freeze when everybody's pipes froze and burst, then you lost your home during that flood. So all of the residents here have been impacted by some sort of natural disaster that was caused by climate change, which is increasing due to the amount of oil and gas industry that we have here in Southwest Louisiana. And to add insult to injury, there are more than 24 proposed facilities along the Gulf Coast, along the Southwest, uh, along the Louisiana Gulf Coast, with more than 10 of those industries being proposed right here in Southwest Louisiana. Enough is enough. We're tired. We are fighting every day for our lives. And now we have to fight against the oil and gas industry to ensure that we can breathe the air that we breathe every day, to ensure that we can drink safe water. We should not have to fight for things that are necessities. Water is life. We should be able to go to our faucets, fill our glass with water, and drink it without worrying about it. Yet, we have to add to the plastic industry by going and purchase bottles of water because we can't drink the water that comes from our faucet. When are we going to stand up and say we will no longer take this in our communities? Historically and disproportionately, these um, industries have built in BIPOC communities, specifically low-income Black communities. It's as if they don't care about us and we were made sacrifices long ago and they continue to pile on crap that does not benefit us. They tell us when they come to our homes, they come into our communities, that they're going to employ us, that they're going to make our lives better, and that's simply not the truth. If that is the case, my organization, The Vessel Project, would not exist. The Vessel Project is a mutual aid organization that I created after all of those storms because so many people needed help. And I was determined to get folks the help that they needed. My organization helps folks with their most emergency needs as barrier-free as possible. There is no red tape. And that's how the government needs to look at helping people. When you call me and say, I need my rent paid, I find the money to pay your rent. When you call me and say, I need my light bill paid, I find the money to pay your light bill. Yesterday, I had an event where we gave out $150 gift cards to 100 people, I had to turn over 300 people away because the need is so enormous. I could not meet the need alone. We are calling on government officials. We're calling on local groups, on bigger organizations, on big nonprofits, anyone who can come and help the citizens of Southwest Louisiana who are very much still in recovery. We're begging you to come here to our community I will bring you on a toxic tour so you can see the industry we already have. I will bring you to see where industry is proposed to be built. And I will let you also see a social justice tour, an environmental justice tour, a climate justice tour, so that you can see which neighborhoods are hurting the most. And you won't be surprised to see that it is the BIPOC communities that are hurting the most. These communities don't have grocery stores. They don't have access to public transportation. Their schools don't have the uh, resources that they need for all of their students. But yet they continue to give industry permits to continue to build here. And when they get these permits and build here, they don't pay taxes. They have so many tax breaks. Imagine if industry paid a portion of the taxes that they save. These communities could have some of their basic needs met, housing, clothing, food, water, yet we found out that our government officials don't care about us. So it's up to us to take care of each other. And that's what I did with Vessel Project. I started off my speech with words from the famous Marvin Gaye, but I would like to end it with a poem that I wrote myself. Give me that, uh, that text. And it's called Breathe. Take a deep breath. Sounds easy, don't it? Well, easier said than done. When the air that you breathe in your very lungs is the same air that will have you on the run to the ER without insurance, waiting for hours with no assurance, gasping for air and needing water 
but not from your own faucet. No, that's not in order. Water to live, water to drink, but not from your own kitchen sink. The kitchen sink attached to the house in your very own corner of the dirty south where you can't afford to pay your rent because on the lights, your money was spent. And now you're sitting here in a waiting room thinking you'll be dying soon all because you decided to breathe. Breathe. Sounds easy, don't it? It used to be not long ago that you could walk out your very own back door. Yes, door, not door. You know the lingo. You could walk outside and see the trees, climb the trees, and breathe their leaves before your neighborhood was taken over and all the trees were cut down because oil and gas was the new mayor in town. Came to town promising to better you, to make your life worth living. <laughs> but it seems like they're the ones doing all the killing. Promise you jobs, but you're still the cleaning lady. Promise you wealth, but you're still robbing Peter to pay Paul. Promise to uplift you, but you still fall. Fall short of welfare, section eight and food stamps. And now to the ER, you set up camp, waiting and waiting all because you decided to breathe. Breathe. Sounds easy, don't it? Well, it ain't. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, my goodness. Rashida, I'm um, having to catch my breath, speaking of breath, because that just brought me to tears, actually. Um, thank you. Thank you for your powerful words, Rashida, and your poem, and the incredible dedication and work that you're doing. It's, it's um, deeply moving, and it also uh, brings about, I would have to say for myself, incredible inspiration, but outrage, just outrage at the injustice. And, um, you know, thanks for breaking our heart open to hear your story. And it's one of the reasons that, you know, we're so dedicated to this divestment work because this is wrong. There are no disposable communities. There are no sacrifice people or zones and zip codes. It has to stop. And this racism and uh, colonial um, system that we're in produces exactly what Rashida is talking about. And we have to say no and draw a red line and say no more, no more, not so that uh, these fossil fuel companies continue to make gazillions of dollars and their financiers at the on the cost of people's safety and health. Um, it, it has to stop. And Rashida, you are a trailblazer and, and we love you and we lift you up. And I'm going to hand the floor over now to uh, Lalita Sura Paninelli, pa, sorry, Sura Paneni, who um, is a medical doctor, and I think she has a lot of other uh, different ways of describing her background. I'll let her speak for herself. But um, I wanted to mention that both Dawn and Roshita are in the new report. Um, we have quoted them. We were given the great opportunity to interview them so that their voices could be a part of that document. And then uh, Lalita um, was able to peer review it so that the research we did on health impacts was uh, professionally reviewed and we thank you for that and you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for having me here today and uh, Don, thank you so much for um, laying out um, the line three uh, struggle as well as Rashida. My God, I'm, I'm still trying to catch my words um, uh, after having uh, listened to you. Um, I with our time today, I wanted to share uh, a little bit about the various health impacts that uh, fossil fuel pollution and uh, climate change uh, have on our health and the disproportionate burden uh, that women take on, uh, both because of the care roles that we play in our families and also direct health impacts. Um, 
the um, you know as, as in my work I'm a hospitalist so that means I take care of uh, people when they get admitted to the hospital when they're very sick um, I also uh, work with a incredible group of uh, health professionals both in Minnesota and nationally um, to um, advocate uh, and work work with frontline communities elevate frontline voices and um, advocate for you know policies that will benefit both our climate and our health um, um, I did want to share my slides and please let me know when you can see them. You see a blank screen. Okay, perfect. Now we see them. Okay. All Great. Uh, so we know that worldwide um, air pollution uh, causes about uh, 7 million premature deaths and um, more than four in 10 Americans still live in places with unhealthy levels of air pollution. Um, even though we've made significant uh, improvements in air quality in the US, as Rashida was just saying, um, these benefits are not for everyone. People of color are 3.6 times more likely uh, uh, to live in counties uh, with uh, failing grades. Um, and typically when we think about air quality and the health impacts that come from it, we think of, you know, um, asthma, but there are so many other um, health problems that come from um, air pollution. Virtually every part of our body is impacted by it. Um, and we know that there's actually uh, what we call a causal link. So uh, that's the holy grail of science. We have so much evidence that we can definitely say that air pollution causes um, childhood asthma. Um, it causes lung cancer and also um, deaths from heart disease. Um, in addition, air pollution has been associated with high blood pressure, strokes, um, you know, dementia, um, brain development for uh, uh, children, as well as um, impacts to um, pre uh, pregnant women and pregnant people where uh, you are at risk for preterm birth. Um, and uh, many of these um, impacts while I am explaining them to you as like, you know, these organs that are being impacted and these individuals being impacted, we know that they don't happen in isolation. Uh, these impacts happen to families. And when that happens, uh, we know that even today, uh, based on the um, American uh, time use survey, we know that women still take on a disproportionate uh, role in care. So that's both child care and elder care in families. Um, and so that burden falls on women in addition to uh, direct health impacts because there's new research that's looking into increased risk of um, air pollution, increasing the risk of breast cancer as well. Um, and this is not just an outdoor air pollution problem, uh, even indoors. And uh, we know that when we use, let's say, natural gas, which uh, is actually methane gas for uh, cooking or heating our homes, um, that that causes dangerous pollutants to show up inside our, our kitchens and our homes. Um, as we know, outdoor air pollution is very strictly regulated, and you can see in this picture uh, from a report uh, by Physicians for Social Responsibility that um, there's safe levels of outdoor air pollution, but the same, you know, methane gas, if you burn it in your house and um, you, let's say bake a cake, that increases um, and causes really high levels of toxic pollutants. Uh, once again, because women are, you know, involved in a disproportionate unpaid, um, you know, household work, which includes cooking, um, that increases exposure to harmful pollutants to women as well. Um, and I next another big health impact that comes from uh, fossil fuels is of course climate change, which is the biggest global health threat in the 21st century uh, and has disproportionate impacts to um, the low-income communities, communities of color, indigenous communities, and those in the global south. Um, and as Rashida has just mentioned, this is not just a you know future far away problem. This, this is happening to communities right here, right now. Uh, while there are so many health impacts that come from climate change, and they're very different for geographically specific health impacts, we know that, you know, extreme heat um, is very deadly. Um, 
just this year, we've seen that um, uh, heat waves in India and Pakistan, which were made 30 times more likely by climate change. Uh, we've seen record high temperatures in California just this month. Um, and as you can see here, heat has many, you know, both physical and mental health impacts on your um, heart, your kidneys. But once again, um, you know, uh, extreme heat can pose risk to uh, pregnant people where it increases the risk of pregnancy loss. So that includes both spontaneous miscarriages as well as um, preterm birth um, and low birth weight in children. And we know that, you know, children who are born preterm um, can carry lifelong health risks as well. And this is, of course, then also happening in the context of reproductive rights being erased all across the country. We know with wildfires, um, again, um, you can have lung problems, heart problems. Uh, however, uh, women um, are at increased risk during their pregnancy uh, because um, there are studies that are linking development of what we call gestational hypertension and diabetes. So that's um, high blood pressure and diabetes that develop during pregnancy, but can carry lifelong uh, risks for uh, throughout the life as well. And it's not just, you know, climate change and air pollution that happen by burning fossil fuels. We know that from the entire fossil fuel life cycle um, does impact health, right? So we know um, whether that's oil and gas drilling or coal mining um, and workers having black lung, whether that's transportation through pipelines refineries, um, and as well as, you know, disposal of toxic waste like coal ash. Uh, those are all going to have health impacts. And once again, disproportionately uh, towards, you know, BIPOC communities and low income communities. Um, and um, we are going to share this link for the Cradle to Grave uh, report. Uh, but I did want to mention a couple of these health risks of living next to oil and gra gas drilling sites. Um, children, babies can be born with um, congenital heart defects. Children are at higher risk for leukemia. Um, again, lung disease, heart disease, as well as kidneys being affected among many other um, health impacts. Um, and we know that oil and gas wells are twice as likely to be located in uh, historically redlined neighborhoods. And this, I wanted to share some of the work that's being done um, at, both in Minnesota and nationally and internationally within the health community, because we need to be, you know, it's no longer that we are just going to take care of, you know, an asthma attack or a heart attack and take care of people coming in with extreme heat effects. We have to work upstream. So we're stepping outside of our clinics and our hospitals and uh, working with communities. So this is uh, some of the work that we've done around line three. As you can see, many uh, doctors as well as nurses, public health professionals, we were involved uh, in speaking with our governor's office, giving public testimony, um, as well as participating participating in demonstrations. Um, this was a day of action where we had health professionals from, you know, across the country um, showing up and calling on President Biden to stop Line 3. Even though construction proceeded with Line 3, we continue to uh, work with our communities. Um, I wanted to share a toxic tour that we recently did with one of our uh, incredible um, environmental justice organizers so that, you know, medical students as well as um, doctors who are caring for patients from the community can actually go witness and see uh, where these health effects are, um, you know, coming from. Uh, we're working with farmers in our community to uh, talk about heat safety, uh, because even up north here, extreme heat is uh, having an impact. We're also working to, um, you know, participate in the public process and advocate for healthy policies. And I'm going to leave you with this last slide, which is um, most recently you might have seen that the World Health Organization um, has endorsed the call for a fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. Um, and I was able to work here uh, through Physicians for Social Responsibility and Global Climate Health Alliance. And uh, this is a very critical step to acknowledge the root cause of uh, all of these health problems and um, 
calling for rapid phase out of fossil fuels. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it over back to you, Asprey. Thank you. Thank you so much for that really powerful uh, presentation, Alita. And also thank you so much for your leadership in um, organizing with other health experts um, and those working in the medical profession to highlight um, the fact that, you know, the fossil fuel companies, um, you know, obviously know of these reports. They are aware of the health impacts that have been going on a long time. And then on top of that, we have the climate crisis. And um, we, it is just provides even more um, foundation and reason uh, for our argument that we must move off of fossil fuels and the era of fossil fuels must be over um, just alone because of the health impacts. So thank you for that really powerful analysis and presentation. And I also just wanted to add um, in our report, and I think Catherine's gonna put uh, a link in the chat again, uh, for those of you who just joined, um, one of the other things that we saw uh, in addition to a lot of the uh, data that Lalita just presented to you, it's in the report, uh, in the case studies, is also for women that are, are responsible for the care economy, meaning the unpaid, unseen labor that goes on in caring for children, uh, elderly, and all of that work that um, makes capitalism possible. Um, is that um, a lot of, there was a, a grouping of women we talked to in the Gulf South that were also letting us know, you know, due to uh, poverty in BIPOC communities, which piles on even more difficulty as Rashida was mentioning, is that, you know, their parents grew food. And that was at least a way that they could also provide um, sustenance for their families, you know? in their gardens and just grow extra food. And now um, the women we're talking to primarily in black communities were saying we can't grow food anymore because the soil is so toxic from fossil fuels that we cannot give this poison food to our families. So that has been taken away and is also impacting women and their ability to care for their families because they can't grow their own food anymore. So um, this, is, this is definitely a crisis that we need to call attention to. Um, and with that, I would like to now move us into another part of the conversation, which is equally important and another component of the need to divest from fossil fuels. Uh, we are going to hear from Jody Evans, co-founder of Code Pink. You have the floor. You're on mute. <laughs> Thank you. Um, thank you, Osprey, for including weapons and war in this conversation. Um, I want to thank Don and Rosetta for bringing us to the front lines of the war economy and its destruction to our lives, our communities, and our planet, and how each of you are responding with what I call the peace economy, and Letha for raising up the violence to our lives and our health and inspiring us with your work. I'm coming to you from the lands of the Ohoni and the Coast Miwok um, in Northern California. So militaries and wars are one of the leading global users of fossil fuels. While countries hide this from their emissions report at all the convenings that discuss how to reduce carbon. We call this the military emissions gap created by pressure from the United States government to exclude them from the Kyoto Protocol. This, while many of the wars in the last 40 years have been for the control of fossil fuels, from the first Gulf War to Iran-Iraq, Sudan, Iraq II, Yemen, and now Ukraine. I was in Iraq before and after the U.S. invasion, and it was clear to the Iraqi that U.S. soldiers wondered while pointing their weapons, what is our oil doing under your sand? One of our actions in Baghdad before the war was a banner that read, we have found the smoking gun, and behind it, we were holding gas nozzles. Now, I know many of you don't remember that the U.S. went to war in Iraq with a bunch of lies, smoking gun being one of them, but the U.S. public was also frightened into supporting that war with Bush's color-coded terror alerts, orange, red, and yellow. It was then that we called Code Pink for Peace. Part of our message and work since has been that war is not green. So with this eight minutes, I want to end that the peace sign means more to you than just peace. 
but the saving of the planet. The elephant in the room of emissions and fossil fuel usage is the Pentagon. It is the largest industrial consumer of oil and therefore largest U.S. emitter of greenhouse gases. It the Pentagon exceeds those of many industrial nations, such as Denmark, Sweden, and Portugal. And with the 20-year war on terror alone, produced 1.2 billion metric tons of greenhouse gases, the carbon equivalent of a 12 million pound mountain of coal. Netta Crawford of Cost of War Project estimates that 70% of that is specifically from aircraft. A Humvee gets between four and eight miles a gallon, which is criminal, but an F-35 requires 2.37 gallons per mile. And the Pentagon has some 585,000 facilities spread over 27 million acres in 160 different countries. You might wonder, what is the US military doing with 800 bases around the world? They are supplying global repression, the support and cover for extraction and destruction of those in the Middle East and Global South. At Code Pink, we are well aware that war just serves the war economy. It is the enforcer for hegemony and corporate greed. Just as with ending the use of fossil fuels, we have all the answers. The same with war and weapons. Diplomacy and negotiations are never in the conversation or funded as we are witnessing tragically in Ukraine and soon with Taiwan. The addiction to fossil fuels places energy security and climate action at the mercy of geopolitics. Governments cannot claim to stand for peace or the planet if they continue to finance and drive war. But just recently, we saw every Democrat in Congress vote for a $40 billion weapons package to Ukraine saying it was humanitarian aid somehow forgetting that weapons kill people. The US is killing people with 65% of our US tax dollars, the same as they are fueling climate crisis with that 65% of our tax dollars, while we witness extreme floods, fires, typhoons, droughts, and more deaths. The awful truth is that even if every person, every automobile, and every factory suddenly emitted zero emissions, the earth would still be headed head first and at full speed toward total disaster for one major reason, the US military, where there are no regulations, accountability, or blame. At Code Pink, we are directing our engagement to weapon sales, primarily planes, since they are the greatest users. We have just launched a program to stop the F-35, the poster child of all that is wrong with weapons manufacturer a program that costs $1.7 trillion. Just to put that in perspective, that is the student debt of 45 million US citizens. F-35 joint strike fighter jets are designed to carry both conventional and nuclear weapons. They have a significant impact on the environment with their high carbon emissions and pollution on local bases. I mentioned the 2.37 gallons of fuel for every mile traveled, but this is around 1,340 gallons of fuel per hour. F-35 pollution is also an environmental justice issue as they are disproportionately tested, trained, and deployed in low-income communities of color. We are currently engaging with working class communities in Vermont and Wisconsin, where health and quality of life have been deeply affected by the F-35 trainings there. If an F-35 crashes, its 10,000 pounds of combustible material would burn in the inferno created by 2,700 gallons of jet fuel. I hope you will think of joining us and the other 200 organizations calling for an end to the F-35. Last week, as a response to flooding devastating Pakistan, what did aid look like from the United States government? 450 million in F-16 fighter jets. And as with the F-35, the principal beneficiary is Lockheed Martin. This is an insight into what dealing with climate change looks like at the Pentagon and State Department. Let's just throw more fuel on the fire. Their plans around emissions is not to reduce them, but to create more opportunities to sell more weapons and make the rich richer, poor countries poor, and more dependent. 
the catastrophe in Pakistan was a direct result of climate chaos. And the greatest suck of fossil fuels is fighter jets. That's what we responded with. All white people are starving, have no place to sleep, or cleaning water to drink. The effects of storage of fossil fuels by the US military has been destructive to many ecosystems and people who live in them. Just last year, the fossil fuel containers on Oahu at Red Hill, a Navy fuel facility above Oahu's biggest freshwater system that has been flooding the surrounding landscape with toxins for decades, leaked yet again, contaminating the water of 90,000 residents in Honolulu, including approximately 9,000 Army, Navy, and Air Force families. Thousands of those affected sought treatments for nausea, headaches, rashes, and other conditions. Tuesday of this week, we joined protests outside the EPA in DC, calling for the closure of Red Hill. Most attending were members of the military who had been horrifically affected. For now, it remains full of fossil fuel and a threat to the community. Stephen Donziger was on hand to speak and finish his remarks with, the Pentagon is Earth's biggest polluter, to riff off the film Abby Martin is currently making Earth's greatest enemy. Ultimately, we must downsize our military budget to meet the crisis. Congresswoman Barbara Lee has a bill to cut the Pentagon in half. A good start. You can support her at Code Pink. We must demand that the cost of war is counted and exposed so we can affect it. We must pressure our government to de-escalate, demilitarize, and call out our leaders who are driving war but say they care about the planet. That's a lie. Peace is necessary for the health of the planet. So join us in our work to cut the Pentagon because it is pivotal to divesting from fossil fuels. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jody, for the years and years of dedication you have to this work and to, to um, really exposing the military and the military's relationship to uh, these intersecting crises that we're facing. Uh, so thank you for your incredible work and uh, leadership in we are putting links into the chat to connect with um, Jody's organization. So thank you for that. Um, and with that, I would like to hand the floor now to Leila Sarza Lopez, who, as I said, is the executive director of Amazon Watch. The floor is yours. Thank you, Osprey. Thank you, sisters, for all your interventions and everything you've shared so far. Um, I am calling in from Lenape territory, also known as New York City, where um, I am here joining our frontline community allies, climate justice allies, youth, um, indigenous peoples from the Amazon to the Congo to Asia, um, and also global leaders who were at the UN. Um, and I say it that way because, you know, I think usually we, we say we're here for Climate Week and we're here for the UN General Assembly, and we are, and I think we're all just so happy to be together after so long. It's been three years, personally, since I have been to New York, and so it's, it's good to be here with everyone and see people in person, and, and also glad that we can share what we're doing here with um, all of you who are not here in New York. Um, we're your delegates, we're your representatives. Um, and so we're doing everything that we can to um, speak truth to power and to uplift and amplify uh, brothers and sisters from the Amazon, um, from tropical forests all around the world um, in solidarity also with many of our community allies we've heard from today. And um, I, um, I would be remiss um, if I didn't mention that my heart is really with um, with the people of Puerto Rico and with the people of Pakistan right now. Um, I know we're all very busy running around um, or going to lots of events and really trying to make the, this time that we're together meaningful. We're here for Climate Week in the midst of a climate crisis. And I don't know what else we need to see than these images coming out of Pakistan, um, these images and these stories coming out of Puerto Rico to, 
to get, I know we know, but to get our global leaders to declare a climate emergency. Um, it truly is heartbreaking and distressing to see these images and for um, so much talk to continue. So um, we're, we're in this, this spirit right now of really knowing what's at stake, seeing it happen right in front of our eyes. And as Osprey mentioned, um, you know, we, we actually live in California, Maloney territory. And for the last few years, we've been feeling really the, the, the effects of the fires. Um, and when I think of the fires taking place in Northern California, it does make me think of the fire taking place um, in the Amazon, which are not accidents, which are not wildfires, they're intentional. In the Amazon rainforest, um, the heart of our planet is on fire. The Amazon rainforest is in a crisis. It's in a state of emergency. Um, the highest record number of fires, highest deforestation record in 15 years has brought the Amazon rainforest to a tipping point. Um, and it is, it is serious and it is dire um, what is being faced in uh, all across the Amazon rainforest. Um, you all have seen the images of fires. Um, you've seen the, the trees falling. You've heard the stories of in, indigenous earth defenders, forest defenders on the front lines under attack and being killed for standing for their rights. And why, why, why is this happening? Why does this continue to happen when we know the Amazon reaching the tipping point affects us all? It doesn't only affect the forest. It doesn't only affect indigenous peoples or peoples living in the forest. The destabilization of the Amazon rainforest directly impacts our entire global weather system. We will not have snow or rainfall in the Rockies or the Sierras if the Amazon rainforest surpasses the tipping point and the flying rivers divert from their course. So we have time, I know that's dire, but we do have time to turn things around. Um, and as Osprey was mentioning earlier, what we, we, what we have to do is stop any further destruction. And the theme that we're talking about today is finance. So we have to stop the financial flows that continue to allow investments in the destruction of the Amazon. So what I'm talking about in, in the last few minutes, I'll just mention a few things that we've been doing this week. We went to BlackRock today with our partners and friends from WeCan and Sunrise Project and New York Communities for, better, for Change and Friends of the Earth and frontline community allies from the Amazon to New York, from Apibi, from Koyabi, from the Brazilian Amazon. Um, and we were out there to tell BlackRock, the biggest investor in climate destruction and one of the biggest investors in Amazon destruction that you cannot have, you can't talk about environmental policies or climate policies for not really putting it in action. Those are just words. Those are just words. And even after indigenous peoples, frontline communities have written and requested meetings, this company has failed to answer. And so that's why we were taking action in front of BlackRock and we're calling upon BlackRock and all of these other ma asset managers to stop investing in Amazon and climate destruction. And it's not just BlackRock, it's Vanguard. It's State Street. These massive financial institutions are investing in the fossil fuel companies that are destroying our, our communities, our people, and our planet. They're investing in companies like Geopark. They're investing in companies like Petro Peru. And this week, we actually released a report called The Risks. I don't know if you can see it because <laughs> of my filter. But we'll put the uh, link. There. Put it, put it close. There we go. Yeah. Oh. Mm. We'll we share have, the link. We'll, we'll, covering we'll, my face. <laughs> we'll share the link. But this report um, talks about what Petro Peru is 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 has done, and what it's seeking to do in the Peruvian Amazon. 
in the territory of the Atwar and the Wampis peoples, which are autonomous nations that say, we do not want any fossil fuel industry in our territory. They've kicked out Geopark, they've kicked out Talisman, and they're gonna kick, kick out Petro Peru with all of our support and solidarity. And um, this week uh, we had invited um, some colleagues, some of the presidents and leaders of the Atwar and the, Peru, um, and the Wampis peoples um, and fisher folk who are also affected by um, Petro Peru on the coast of Peru. Um, we had invited them here, but due to some visa issues, they weren't able to make it, but they'll be here in a few weeks and they're going to be meeting with Vanguard and they're gonna be meeting with HSBC and Chase and Vanguard and hopefully BlackRock to tell them that they do not want these financial institutions, these banks to be investing in Petro Peru. Petro Peru's license to operate is null. They don't have permission to go into the Atwar and, and Wampi's territories. And so that's what we need to continue to tell these banks um, of Petro Peru and any other fossil fuel industry, fossil fuel company, um, and any other extractive industry. We also, um, I know my time is up, so I'll just mention briefly that we also released a report on blood gold. I know it's not fossil fuel, but it's the extractive industry. It's these drivers like the mining industry, like the fossil fuel industry, the oil and gas industry, the agribusiness companies. All of these industries are causing havoc and causing Amazon destruction and they need to be held to account. And so that is really what we're doing at Amazon Watch is standing in solidarity with indigenous peoples, forest peoples um, who are on the front lines, who are protecting the forests um, and all life in the Amazon for our future, for our climate. And we are standing with them to call upon these corporations, these governments, and these financial institutions to be held to account. So um, thank you all for listening. Thank you all for having me. And um, I'll, I'll share a couple links in the, in the chat and look forward to, to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much, Leila, for your incredible work and dedication and, and these reports. Just so you know, we've been putting them in the chat as you speak. You're welcome to put them again, but just so you know, we've we've put them in the chat for everyone. Those are really important reports and they've been very effective um, in, in supporting frontline leaders. And, and just to say that these reports that Leila's mentioning, uh, the reports that um, Jody and others are mentioning Lolita, you know, we, we put these out because we know they're educational tools and also a form of exposure so that people can understand what is going on and be able to expose these injustices and harms, give people details, but it's also an advocacy tool. Um, we know we want frontline communities to have this research and that's really important to them. And also, it's a tool that we then give to the financial institutions that they can look at the research we've done on them and the impacts that they're having. So um, just, just uh, I got a question that I, that I wanna respond to is um, in the report that we can put out today, um, we could name a lot of companies. Uh, we kept the scope of our report to the United States and parts of Canada because it's such a large topic to talk about the gendered and racial impacts, but it applies um, to the world really. But some of the worst actors are here in the United States in terms of financiers. And we address Vanguard, BlackRock. Vanguard and BlackRock are asset management firms. Then we address banks, Captain, uh, uh, also another asset management firm. Um, and we have JP Morgan Chase. Um, we are addressing Royal Bank of Canada, Bank of America, and Liberty Mutual, which is um, an insurance company. So when we're talking about financial institutions, it's across the board with asset management firms, banks, and insurance companies, and all the different ways that they uh, contribute to being complicit in this destruction by financing companies. And sometimes people ask me, well, what are the insurance companies? How are they involved? Well, you can't put in a fossil fuel pipeline as an example, unless it's insured. So if you can pull insurers out of projects, you also have the opportunity to, to shut down a harmful project. Um, 
I would love to get some questions going here in the chat from uh, those of you who are listening in. I will be looking for your questions in the chat uh, to, to ask the panelists for any clarity or thoughts that you have. We'd love to hear from you. Um, and while uh, we're, we're looking for um, some questions coming out of the chat and uh, Catherine and Ashley can help me keep track of that. Thank you. Um, I would like to go around and and just um, may, maybe hear from each of you what you have seen being the most um, strategic um, approach to your divestment work. You know, if we could just go around and just hear like, what have you found to be effective in your divestment strategy? Um, I think that we are trying to get um, Roshita and Dawn back online. I know Ashley's probably working on that because they both were in remote areas. So I hope we get them back so they can respond to some questions. But maybe we could start with you, Lalita, and then go to Jody, and then go to Layla for with some just short, short responses on what you have found to be effective in your divestment work. Yeah, I I could probably not speak to financial divestment, but we have definitely, you know, uh what I found most um, compelling is to have that public health impact uh, come through because, you know, we all are impacted by air pollution, um, no matter where we are, um, you know, while frontline communities get the first and worst of these impacts. Um, and like so many of uh, us either personally have like um, asthma or a lung condition or know someone who has it. And so really making sure that we bring that public health lens into that conversation. Um, and at the same time, I think just being able to uh, work with communities, not this like very ivory tower approach of, you know, like we're, we're scientists or doctors and we know everything and rather like flipping that uh, power structure and making sure that we actually listen to the communities and respond to the need where it is. I think that's been most um, uh, fruitful in our work. Great. Thank you. That's good to know. Jody. Yes. You know, I say that it's really been the research, the deep research that people have done in universities and the scientists across the world that have decided to shine a light on this missing place. So super grateful for the research. And there's two websites that came out of us bringing this issue of military missions to the streets at, at COP in Glasgow. And those are um, the Conflict and Environmental Observatory it's ceobs.org and militaryemissions.org. It's like, you know, the governments have wanted to keep this in hiding for a very long time. And it's their brave work and important work um, of getting it out. And they, they're continuing to do this research. And then it's those that when they learn are furious that this has been hidden and it's enormous cost that this is the greatest contributor and we don't know. I remember, you know, handing out the stickers in Glasgow and hundred and, you know, 10,000 people marching. And here you are marching for the planet and not a person knows that, you know, about this greatest cost. So education um, that then we see inspires action. And then of course, as we've seen today, raising up the stories of those who have felt the costs of war, you know, those in Red Hill, those around the world that, um, you know, like right now, um, Guam, Guam is a beautiful island and um, the U.S. is already at war in China, um, using the islands in the Pacific, um, Asia Pacific, Guam, the Mariana Islands, their, their lives, their health, and their pristine ecosystems are already being um, destroyed. I, uh, Julian Aguan is on tour with his No Country for Eight Spot Butterflies to tell the story of what's happening there. So definitely raising up the stories of what the costs of war are. And I want to say about the costs of war, that is what the U.S. media avoids. The U.S. media, which is a propaganda machine, mainstream media, is the promoters of war. And what you can see is that they hide all the costs of war. And as we've heard today, you know, 
eloquently that we're all paying the price of the costs of, of war and fossil fuels. And we need to keep raising up those intimate stories. Thank you so much, Jody. Really helpful. Thank you. Leila? Oop, you're on mute. Could you repeat the question again? I'm sorry. Uh, that's, that's all right. It's, <laughs> there's a lot going on here. The question is, what have you found to be most strategic, um, most effective in your divestment work? What has been a successful strategy or um, you know, something you want to uplift about your approach to divestment work? Uh, yeah. Um, I mean, the first thing that really comes to mind is... Um, is bringing the the voices of um, our partners to the boardrooms, to the meetings of these companies, and you know, starting with BlackRock, I think just reflecting on 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 the first meeting. I think it was a first shareholder meeting that um, that we went to with some of our partners from Ecuador after the BlackRock's big problem campaign launched and. I don't think they realized they didn't know what was coming and they, they mean, it was actually kind of easy to get into the BlackRock shareholder meeting the first year, easy relative to other companies like Chevron and others that you have to work really hard to get proxies to get into the shareholder meetings. But this one was relatively open. Um, I just don't think BlackRock really realized how much of a impact um, having the frontline community members there at their shareholder meeting and having their shareholders and their board of directors here directly from um, communities that were directly impacted by the companies they were investing in. So that's, I mean, that's always um, super important. I mean, and that's one of our strategies at Amazon Watch is to ensure and amplify indigenous people's voices, solutions and resistance. And um, so that's super powerful. Um, you know, we didn't used to write a lot of reports, <laughs> I have to say, and part of the reason we even do finance work was because we had been researching um, the, and tracing the oil from the Amazon and where it's going. And we found, um, we, 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 we already knew, but our research was confirmed um, a few years ago when we were looking at the Blueburn terminal over at, um, at the offices of our friends at RAN. And our, um, some of our volunteers and, um, and team members were looking through the Blueburn terminal doing financial research. And they found a lot of data about um, Amazon oil coming to California and tracing the oil back to California. And we did an initial report and then just last November, we released another report confirming that over 50% of Amazon crude comes directly to California. And so we, in that process of looking into the crude and tracing the crude, we started actually digging up who's, who's like financing, where, where are they getting the money to do this? Because I mean, Ecuador is in debt, they're in debt to China. How, how are they getting the money to do this? Well, we started looking at the asset managers started looking at at the private banks and the public banks who are who are funding this and so that was how our finance work and um and our on the on the private banks and the asset managers began and then we work with stand earth we launched a campaign called the exit amazon oil and gas and that is specifically around demanding an, an exclusion policy similar to how companies have exclusion policies for the Arctic. We will not drill in the Arctic. We're calling for an exclusion policy for the Amazon. So you shouldn't be Amazon investing in Amazon destruction. It should be one of the last places we should continue doing any kind of drilling. We shouldn't be drilling. We should stop extraction. And we need to say that every single time we're in these spaces and in the spaces at COP, for example, we need to repeat and repeat and repeat our you know, what we call our tagline, keep it in the ground and stop extraction um, if we want climate justice. Thank you. Thank you so much, Layla. And uh, Dawn, I'm so glad that you're back with us. Um, we're having a discussion about, you know, effective strategies, um, you know, for divestment. And 
I've been really honored um, out of um, when we took a stand at We Can at Standing Rock during the Dakota Access Pipeline. I had the honor of meeting Michelle Cook, who is a Diné human rights attorney. And I mentioned her earlier. She's the founder of Divest and Best Protect. And she invited me to, to work with her on Indigenous women's divestment delegations. And we, too, find that it's most important to um, have impacted communities, and in our case, uplifting women, um, frontline women, speak for themselves to these companies and arrange engagements for them to um, be able to hear what it is their investments are doing. I think there's that uh, impact from hearing from people on the ground that removes it from you know looking at a checkbox and just reading about human rights violations to actual human beings who are being harmed by the very people they're sitting in the same room with, um, I think is very important. And, and then also um, a lot of information we see missing around um, you know, what, what is the understanding of human rights? What is the understanding of indigenous rights? What is the understanding of free prior and informed consent? Or as Dom was talking about, the lack of knowledge or respect for treaty rights um, in the United States as an example, but also indigenous rights all over the world and uh, the right to say no and not give consent to these companies. I think it's really important. And many times these financial institutions um, need to become aware that they are actually violating rights by investing in these companies that are, are doing these harms and not respecting indigenous people's um, wishes. So I think that you know, it's really important to one, have these stories from frontline communities um, and have indigenous led leadership, frontline leadership in these spaces. Um, and then, as many of you mentioned, um, you know, all of this research that's being done that can back up a lot of um, the details around, um, you know, the health impacts and the harms to the earth, um, both for people and planet. And with that, I'd like to give the floor to you, Dawn, because I can see her back online and just wanted to, we're coming up to, to the close. And I maybe we'll give you the final word here on just your thoughts about you know, strategically, what do we need to be doing, how we can support you in protecting your community, and, and what you see with these companies, both like Enbridge, but also the, the banks that, that, that invest in them. Bonjour, once again. Um, maybe, maybe you could turn your video off. Oh, sorry. Maybe turn your video off again. How is that? Much it's better? Better, better, thank you. Okay, sorry, uh, we're in route uh, right now. Um, yeah, so things, how you could help us is to um, elevate what's happening here in online three. Uh, there's a science team that I'm a part of. Uh, we're a group of uh, people that have come together um, that bring what, uh, what they have to the table. And we're, um, what we are doing is, um, it's called Wadukawad Amekwok, and those who help beaver. And so when uh, the breaches and the frack outs happened, we noticed the beavers were taking red willow and filtering uh, the Mississippi River. And so we wanted to keep an eye on things. So we, a group of us, has been going out on the, the lands and um, that's, we discovered a lot of different things in the frack out zones. And so we have a webpage, um, Wad, um, uh, we can get the exact spelling for you um, in the future. And so there's different ways, use your own talents. Um, so help us um, get that message across to Wisconsin and Michigan uh, what has happened with, uh, they call them sheet filings, and that's what's pounded down into the, the earth, and that is what has ended up breaching the aquifers. And uh, so get that messaging out for us. Um, what were some other questions <laughs> there, uh, Osprey? Uh, um, maybe, oh, yeah. Go ahead. What was the other question you asked? Um, I just, um, you know, just hearing any closing thoughts that you have for us, you know, okay. just as someone who's been, 
really on the front lines and is, is doing this incredible work. Just, you know, something to, to help us, uh, you know, close out our session here, our closing thoughts that you have. Yes, now I recall my brain was thinking too when you were asking those questions. So two things I'd like to highlight here is what I learned um, um, as we were on the front lines with line three is about relationships and relationship building and unity. So I had this notion of unity is how everybody's getting along and all this unity. Well, human nature, it's impossible for everybody to get along. But what we need to do is you can still have unity. And it's, um, some may call it cliques or whatever um, groups of people. Um, we can still be united in our cause and do our own things and but respect each other across those groups of people. So the respect part is very important um, moving forward. Um, what else? And also um, women, women are the ones to take care of the water. Um, that is our in duty as women. And, uh, but within that, do not lose sight of the importance of our men and keeping that balance. Uh, that is one important thing I want to bring to the table is um, ensure that our men are being asked and being part of what we are doing. So, uh, be which. Thank so you so much. Thank you, Don, for joining us. And um, I look forward to continuing our work on line three and line five with you. And uh, thank you for your courage and your dedication and uh, showing such great leadership. And with that, we're really closing in on the end of our session here. And I just wanted to thank all of our panelists for your really powerful work. And, you know, it's really interesting because when you tell people you're doing, you know, uh, divestment work on fossil fuels or deforestation commodities, it is not sexy. Definitely not like, oh, this sounds really interesting. We're going to talk finance here and numbers and get into the nitty gritty health issues. Um, but actually, it's very powerful. The divestment work, we've seen literally billions of dollars being moved out of these sectors because of the collective work of divestment campaigners around the world. And we are creating pressure. And we have seen policy changes. We have seen their, you know, the industry having to respond, even though it's very skittish. Um, we're here. We were outside BlackRock today. We're everywhere, really confronting them with being a part of the solution instead of investing in the destruction. And I think that this is gaining incredible momentum. And I really want to thank everyone for our collective effort because it is working and it needs to become louder and the window of time is small. But I'm always really encouraged when I hear from all of you and um, thank you so much for your work. Don, I see your hand up, and I don't know if that was intentional. Did you want to say one more thing? Please go ahead. I have one last in, but um, we are having a Firelight Clearwater River at the Airport Road in Bagley, Minnesota, October 29th through October 2nd. It is in solidarity with Treaty Days in Mount Island, the capital of the Jubilee Nation, and um, also to commemorate the year that we were there for 26 days and to be in community. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a good time. Thank you, Dawn. And what a great example of a powerful organizer. Never leave a meeting without inviting people to another activity. So thank you, Don, for showing the true spirit of an organizer, which is you just keep organizing. Um, and with that, um, sending everyone best wishes with your work and look forward to continuing to collaborate. And thank you all for listening in. We really appreciate uh, you participating in the panel with us. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Osprey. We can. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Onward to peace without fossil fuels. Yes. <laughs>